I have a new method for making copper and zinc countertops. I'm doing two experimental tabletops for a restaurant job that I'm bidding out. And I'm going to attempt to explain why this new method works better than the old method, which was the Advantech. And if you've watched my previous build videos working with the metal, it's probably the Advantech. I did try the new method on my last oval tabletop build and it appeared to work very well. But the Advantech was an attempt to mediate the problem that I always had with the glue bond separation between the metal and the substrate. This would occur from stress that builds up at the glue bond from dimensional change of the substrate. And when I started making these countertops, I used plywood, which created all kinds of hazards and disasters for the business. I had to do many repair jobs and some tabletops over again. You might think of plywood as being a choice stable material, but when gluing metal onto things, it's kind of a different story. So plywood does change dimension considerably, even though you might think of it as being stable. The Advantech was more stable than the plywood, but it did not eliminate the problem I had, especially for really long or large countertops. And so I needed to come up with a new method that was more reliable and eliminated the possibility of callback and problems with the customer. So uh, this new method involves using solid poplar oriented in alternating grain directions. And the reason why this works better is it takes advantage of the lengthwise grain of the solid wood, which is stable and does not change dimension with the moisture content. So the dimensional change of solid wood happens across the grain in that direction, but in the lengthwise direction you can count on it being very not changing. <laughs> and so making a tabletop in this way makes it so that all sides are locked in place and it takes the stress from building up and towards the center of the tabletop and each of these pieces of wood is allowed to expand and contract a little bit individually and there's a little bit of space in between each one that I used an index card to uh, line them up so that the glue, when it goes on first, it soaks into the wood fibers and that creates a little bit of stress from the uh, expansion of the glue and the fibers. So the, uh, this method breaks up that planar stress into little sections. It's kind of like woodworking in calculus. And so it takes the stress out from building up in any location and that was the cause of the glue bond failure or oil canning, you get a puffy spot that is just kind of like a springy, annoying thing, and some customers don't like that. So, um, anyways, this is the new method, solid poplar. It's more expensive, more involved. How much more involved is what I'm calculating with this experiment, doing a timed run, adding up all the steps, milling the wood, and putting it on in this way so I can do a more accurate estimate or decide not to do the job and that's uh, what I have going on right now.
Okay, here is the spreadsheet with all the values for each step in the order that I did them. And I get a sum total of 4.18 hours for two. So dividing by two is 2.09 hours each, which doesn't seem like a lot. And it isn't really. But keep in mind, this is just the processing time, actively doing the work, running the machines, clamping, unclamping. And it does not include the brainstorming, the setup time, or the downtime in between steps because I'm either tired or waiting for the glue to dry. So the setup time is difficult to measure accurately, so I leave that part out for estimation based on the size of the job. And this is the part that I measure accurately, which is just the processing time. And I can extrapolate from that what I need to know later on. So material cost, I add up all the materials that I use, the poplar plywood, the rough cut solid poplar. I forgot to add the shipping of the zinc. For some reason I thought that was included in the price. So I left that part out, made a mistake there. So about $150 is the real cost of making each countertop. And I can show all this in a graph form. I like these handy little pie charts that you can compare and contrast different steps. So here are all the steps with the minutes for making two countertops. And I can also represent the values in the form of a percent. So here's a more simplified version of that pie chart that just shows the parts making the substrate. So this would be the woodworking part. This would be the glue up. And then the blue part is the metalworking, which is still the majority of the work, but making the substrate definitely added a lot to the total process. And again, you can see that as a percent. And here is the pie chart for the material cost, which again does not include the shipping, but you can see it represented that way. So I made these two zinc countertops mainly for the purpose of estimation, which I don't normally do, but I wanted to measure the steps accurately and test out the new substrate method. And so I came up with a number, produced it for the estimate, and with the table so that, so that the restaurant could test it out, see what it looked like. And unfortunately, they rejected the number. It was more than their budget could afford, so I was bummed out about that. But I ended up leaving the table there anyways so that they could test it out. Maybe they would change their mind. And interestingly, they took it home and left it outside at a party. And I wasn't too happy about that at first. But then it rained that night, and that produced an interesting patina on the surface of the zinc. And that was a game changer. They changed their mind. They wanted the unique character, adding a touch of class to their restaurant. And then I got the job. So now I'm going to be making a whole restaurant full of these tables and some copper tables. And that's why I work with copper and zinc, because they're materials that have an appeal and they sell. And, uh, well, that's my story. So I hope you liked the video and check out my blue bumpers. I got some new colors in stock. Check them out, cuttingboardfeet.com. Have a nice day. And I have one thing left to do, which I didn't realize before. Usually I cover up the metal with some wood or something, but I filed the edges down so it's not sharp on the edge, but I still have this corner that will catch skin if you jam your finger in there and pinch it, and that could be a problem. So I'm gonna mitigate that by just spooging some silicone in there and filling up that gap, and that'll prevent anybody's fingers from getting pinched.